Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the glycine receptors. Okay, so we're in the process of discussing uh, the opening of the glycine receptors. Okay, so we've got our glycine receptor here in the closed forward slash resting state. Okay, uh, then when ligand binds, when glycine binds to the extracellular domain of this glycine receptor, what that's going to cause is it's going to cause a conformational change that will take this glycine receptor into the open state. So here now is the glycine receptor in the open state. Now, I would love to be able to tell you how many glycines bind to the extracellular domain of the glycine receptor, but this information is not known. Uh, so, all we know is that glycine binds to the extracellular domain of the glycine receptor, and that that causes it to open. Now, to make it a little bit more obvious, I will draw a little square there to show the ligand actually bound to this glycine receptor, but that isn't supposed to suggest that only one glycine binds to the extracellular domain of the glycine receptor. Multiple could bind. We just don't know this fact. Okay, so the glycine receptor goes from being in the closed resting state to being in the open state uh, when the ligand binds, which in this case is glycine. Now, the question is, does, um, does the ligand binding to the glycine receptor leave it permanently in this open state now? So as long as the ligand remains bound, do, do we retain this open state? The answer is no, basically. Uh, the glycine receptor will uh, desensitize, basically, uh, and close, even though the ligand remains bound. So there is a third state that it goes into. Okay, so let's show this state. So it's going to go back into a conformation which is closed, so a conformation that does not allow ions to move through. Okay, so here is this other stage now, and here is the ligand bound to the extracellular aspect. So the ligand is still bound, and this is the closed forward slash desensitized state, and this is a different state to this closed state here, even though I've drawn it the same way just to get across the message that it is um, closed, um, it's, uh, it is fundamentally a different state of the receptor, the actual molecular structure of this is different to uh, the structure of this one. Okay, so basically when uh, ligand binds to the receptor, it opens for a while and then it closes again and it goes into this closed, desensitized state. So the question then is, how long does it remain open for before going into the closed, desensitized state? And the answer is, it's not a set value, basically. So uh, this time interval that it takes for the receptor to go from being in the open state to being in the closed, desensitized state, that's not a fixed amount of time, basically. Instead, it can vary. So, uh, it can vary between different receptors, and it can also vary at different points, basically. I, on different trials, if you have a single receptor, and you uh, bind ligand to it, then it will open, and it will take a certain amount of time to uh, go into the closed desensitized state. If you repeat the experiment again with the exact same receptor, you may well get a different answer for how long it takes to go from being in the open state to being in the closed desensitized state. So all we can say is that there is a mean open time. Okay, so we can say there's an average, but we can't say for sure how long it will actually take uh, for a any old receptor at any particular time to go from being in the open to the closed desensitized state. So it's a probabilistic event, basically. Okay, uh, but there is a mean, there is an average. So, to summarize then, when the ligand binds to, uh, to the uh, glycine receptor, it's going to cause that glycine receptor to be, to, to be transiently in this open state before it will then move on to being in this closed desensitized state. Now the question is, what does it do when it's in this open state? Well, basically, it's permeable to chloride anions. So the glycine receptor is an anionic channel. So it's permeable to anions. Okay. Now the question is, 
what um, direction is chloride going to move uh, through this open channel? And for this, we need to consider two things. We need to consider what are the concentrations of chloride anions on either side of this membrane. And we also need to consider what is the electrical potential difference across the membrane. Okay, so we'll start with the concentration gradient. So roughly, uh, the concentration of chloride anions extracellularly uh, and by the way, this is the extracellular fluid on this side. Okay, extracellularly, the concentration of chloride anions is 110 millimolar or thereabouts, whereas the concentration intracellularly is around 4 millimolar. So you have a nearly 30 fold concentration gradient favoring the movement of chloride anions in. So the concentration gradient is favoring chloride to move in. However, we now need to consider the electrical potential difference across the membrane. So let's just discuss what the electrical potential difference across a membrane actually means so that we can understand fully uh, what this is going to contribute to the scenario. Okay, so um, if I have a little man standing in the extracellular uh, fluid, he can measure the electrical potential in the extracellular fluid. So basically, electrical potential, or big E, is a, a mathematical construction to help us understand reality. Uh, so you ascribe to every point in three-dimensional space a little real number. So if you go to any point in three-dimensional space, there is a number ascribed to that point known as the electrical potential. Okay, so if he's in the extracellular fluid, Basically, all of the points in the extracellular fluid will roughly have the same electrical potential. So he is measuring that electrical potential. So big E for electrical potential, and I'll put little e to denote extracellularly. extracellularly. Okay, so this is the electrical potential extracellularly. Okay, so then what he can do is he can come into the intracellular fluid, and he can measure electrical potential here. Okay, and these numbers will not be the same, basically. So, the number his little machine for measuring electrical potential shows when he's in the extracellular fluid will be different from the number it shows when he's in the intracellular fluid. What we can then ask is what's the difference between these, and this is what's meant by electrical potential difference. So, we can ask if he was to move from the extracellular to the intracellular compartment, how would his, the electrical potential change? What would the difference in electrical potential he would feel in going from here to here be? And this is what's known as the... Um, where should I write this? I'll put it down here. This is what's known as the electrical potential difference, or the voltage, from extracellular to intracellular. Now, people often get sloppy when they're talking about electrical potential differences between extracellular compartment and the intracellular compartment. Uh, they just instead say the voltage across the membrane. They, they drop this from extracellular to intracellular. You should really direct it. it you should say, I want the electrical potential difference from here to here, but people often drop that. They don't tell you that. And in my opinion, it's bad because uh, to really understand this, you need to know that it's from extracellular to intracellular. But people assume that you understand that, so they just say the voltage across the membrane or the electrical potential difference across the membrane or the resting membrane potential. And what they really mean is if you moved from the extracellular to the intracellular compartment, how much would the number on your screen uh, that's measuring electrical potential, how much would that change? Okay, so how much would it change? Well, basically, what we need to do is take the electrical potential intracellularly, the new electrical potential, and subtract off the electrical potential extracellularly. So, if you take the new one, and then take away the old one, that will give you how much this number would change if you moved from here to here. Okay, so that's what's meant by the voltage across the membrane or the electrical potential difference across the membrane. Right, so usually this is around negative 65 millivolts. Okay, now what that means is that if you move from the extracellular to the intracellular compartment, your electrical potential 
that you're measuring on this screen will go down, and it will go down by 65 millivolts. So the electrical potential intracellularly is lower than the electrical potential extracellularly by a whole 65 millivolts. That's what it means. Okay, so that's the usual electrical potential difference for a cell to have. There are some um, alterations to this, you know. So, uh, certain uh, smooth muscle cells have an electrical potential difference across their membrane of negative 60, meaning that the intracellular compartment is only 60 millivolts lower than the extracellular compartment, whereas skeletal muscle cells have an electrical potential difference across their membrane of negative 95 millivolts, which means that the intracellular compartment is lower in electrical potential than the extracellular compartment by a whole 95 millivolts. So it does vary from cell to cell, but the general average is negative 65, and that's usual for a neuron. Okay, so we are working with neurons, so we'll assume that its electrical potential difference across its membrane is negative 65 millivolts. Okay, so basically chloride is a negatively charged ion. It wants to be in the place where the electrical potential is highest. Okay, so listen to that again. Negatively charged particles want to be at higher electrical potentials. They're attracted to higher electrical potentials. So, the chloride anions will want to go to the extracellular compartment, basically. So, the electrical gradient across this cell is favouring the movement of chloride anions out of the cell. So then the question is, which one wins? Because the concentration gradient is favouring the movement in, and uh, the um, electrical gradient is favouring the movement of chloride anions out. I feel like, little finger, who, who wins when the um, hand of the king says one thing and the queen says the other thing? Uh, so, um, we've got the... Um, concentration gradient trying to drive chloride anions in, and we've got the uh, electrical gradient trying to drive chloride anions out. Which one is stronger? Well, basically, the concentration gradient wins. The force to go outwards is smaller than the force to go inwards. Well, the uh, favouring to go in outwards is um, smaller than the favouring to go inwards. Okay, so uh, you still end up with a net movement of chloride anions inwards. Um, in order to um, stop the movement of chloride anions across this cell, basically what you'd have to do is make the electrical potential difference more extreme. You'd have to make it more negative. If it were more negative, then this arrow would grow, basically, and then eventually they'd be equal to one another, so there would be no net movement across the um, cell membrane. But when you're only at negative 65 millivolts, the, um, the concentration gradient basically beats the electrical gradient. So you still get a net movement of chloride anions into the cell. It will be smaller than if the electrical potential difference hadn't been there, but it will still be into the cell. So when you open this glycine receptor on the cell membrane, you are going to bring chloride anions into the cell. Now, chloride anions carry a negative charge, so you are bringing negatively charged particles from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment. Now, when you put negatively charged particles into the intracellular compartment, that's going to reduce the electrical potential intracellularly, so this number is going to go down. In addition, you are removing the negatively charged particles from the extracellular fluid. Okay, so the electrical potential here is going to go up because you're taking negative charge out. Uh, so the electrical potential goes up. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.